Thank you for joining our webinar as we bring IBD experts here to answer COVID-19 questions that are on your mind. We are very pleased to be presenting tonight's webinar alongside the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. No doubt, COVID-19 is having an impact on the dynamics of families with many caregivers wondering what this means to children living with chronic diseases like IBD. Having a child with Crohn's or colitis can be an emotional roller coaster at the best of times. It's hard as a parent or a caregiver to see your child ill and now having to deal with the concerns of this pandemic. Along with content and resources, Crohn's and Colitis Canada offers a number of programs to help children and young adults, such as our Camp Got to Go. Children with IBD can feel isolated and alone, and having a camp just for them helps build confidence and independence as they make new friends and discover new things. This year is a little different, of course, as our physical camps will combine into one virtual camp, connecting kids in an even bigger and special way. If you have a child with IBD, I encourage you to apply through our website. Another one of our programs is our AbV IBD scholarship. While our school season has been disrupted, it's the perfect time to think ahead. Each year, Crohn's and Colitis Canada awards 10 scholarships of $5,000 to students of any age living with Crohn's or colitis who are enrolled in a Canadian post-secondary educational institute for the upcoming fall session. If this sounds appealing to you, please submit your application by June 1st. As you can see, Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's and colitis and to improve the quality of life of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. As part of our COVID-19 response efforts, we continue to expand our COVID-19 online resources and bring you these weekly webinars. If you haven't already, please follow our at Get Gutsy Canada social media channels to stay informed. A special thank you to all our healthcare providers. Last week, we celebrated Doctors' Day, and next week begins National Nursing Week. Today and every day, we are so grateful for all that our healthcare workers do to keep us healthy and safe. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And to all our moms, wishing you a very happy Mother's Day this weekend. This Mother's Day is unlike one we've ever experienced, so it's more important than ever for families to stay connected. As such, we've created a special e-card to honor our moms by sending a virtual hug. To send a hug, scan the QR code on the slide. Finally, a big thank you to our task force, as always, who have also volunteered their time and skills to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community during these times. Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Ann Griffiths, Dr. David Mack, Dr. Benjamin Gold, Dr. Edwin DeZoten, and Dr. Upton Allen. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators, Dr. Gil Kaplan. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Calgary. He's an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist, but he is the chair of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as a board director with Crohn's and Colitis Canada. And Dr. Eric Benjamal. He is the associate professor and gastroenterologist, Department of Pediatrics and School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa, Division of Gastroenterology at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. He is also chair-elect of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Yeah. That's great. It's good yeah, to be back. This is an uh, amazing um, webinar that we have set. I can't believe this is actually our eighth weekly webinar. Um, we started um, March 19th um, and two months, actually. I'm not sure for everyone else, but it feels like two years has gone by. Um, and um, this webinar is actually a really special one for two major reasons. Um, the first one is um, with the provinces now moving towards kind of relaxing the lockdown and the physical distancing restrictions, um, the COVID uh, IBD task force met last Tuesday, um, two days ago, for nearly two hours to discuss the implications of those changes to society for the IBD community. Uh, and we had a very serious discussion around all the different issues uh, related to that. I think a very strong focus um, on the impact to children and family. And, and that's why the other major aspect of this, and Eric, I'll, I'll let you kind of talk about it, is our partnership um, to come together and, and set up a really nice um, uh, program to support children and their parents um, who have IBD. 
Yeah, so this is our first joint webinar with another organization. It's with uh, the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, or NASPGAN for short. It, that is the professional society that represents all pediatric GIs across North America, uh, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, and is also the uh, the lead for the NASPGAN Foundation, which produces a lot of educational material for for children and families living with IBD, as well as other gastrointestinal illnesses. You can see some of their educational material at uh, gikids.org. But um, we have some links between Crohn's and Colitis Canada and NASPGAN. Uh, I myself am the Canadian counselor on NASPGAN Council, and so we approach them to sort of hold this joint seminar. And so we have a, a sort of a whole group of pediatric pediatricians, really, uh, but four out of five of them are, are pediatric gastroenterologists, two from the U.S., two from Canada, and then Dr. Upton Allen, uh, who it's an honor to have on this webinar as well, who's uh, Division Head of Infectious Diseases at SickKids and is a really uh, an internationally renowned infectious disease clinical specialist as well as researcher. And he's going to talk to us and provide his, uh, his uh, view on what's happening with COVID-19 in children now. So very Excellent. exciting today. Yeah, and so what we're going to do for the for this is really kind of three segments. I'm going to briefly do um, my short um, update from what's happened in the past week, particularly around the epidemiology of COVID and, and its impact on IBD. Eric's going to come and tell us about the recommendations that we've um, um, evolved. And I think these are the biggest changes and recommendations we've had since the first one that we launched back on, on March 19th. Uh, and then we'll, we'll segue into the big part of the segment, which is the the, the pediatric session. Um, so what I'll do is, I'll, let me just take over control of the computer here, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides. Okay, so everyone hopefully can see that. Um, so, um, and like I said earlier, it's insane that this has been our, our eighth week doing this. If you remember, we started back on March 19th. Um, and if you, um, Follow this. This is a site from John Hopkins University that tracks the global cases. Um, and you can see back on March 19th, there were 230,000 people who um, were confirmed positive with, with COVID. Um, by March 26th, that number had gone up to half a million people. Um, and then now kind of skipping a few weeks, just looking at the, at the last three weeks. Three weeks ago, we were at 2.6 million people. Last week at 3.2 million people. And as of this morning, there are 3.8 million individuals across the world who have been diagnosed with COVID. Um, 1.2 million have recovered. Unfortunately, the, the death rate is now over 260,000 people, and, and we're reporting um, COVID in 187 countries throughout the world. Um, and, and I've started showing this a, a few weeks back because we can start to really get a sense of the impact of COVID around the world. Again, these are now 40 countries that have reported over 10,000 cases. Um, and if you then standardize um, those cases against the size of the population, meaning that larger countries like the U.S. are going to have more cases because there's more people living in the U.S. than a country like Canada, we can start to see which are the hardest hit um, countries um, in the world. We can see the green countries have one to 50 cases per 100,000 people. Um, the yellow cases, uh, sorry, countries have 50 to 200 cases per 100,000 people. Uh, and the hardest hit countries are, are the, the red ones with over 200 cases per 100,000. And if we kind of look at the top 10, all of which have had more than 200 cases per 100,000, um, we can see Qatar in the Middle East, Spain, Ireland. These are countries that we've been seeing now for, for the last um, a while. The U.S. is in uh, the fifth country at 371 cases per 100,000. Um, and you can kind of see Canada um, being at 170 cases per 100,000. So we are creeping up there, but we're still kind of in the middle of pack of, of kind of the hardest hit countries um, in, in the world. Now, looking specifically at Canada, again, this is an amazing website from um, Esri Canada, the COVID-19 Canadian outbreak tra tracker. Uh, I showed this data back on March 19th. This was the first time that um, I presented this data. It was 780 Canadians. Um, on March 26th, it jumped up to 3,400, and then if we're looking at the last three weeks, we can see 40,000 Canadians um, with COVID on uh, April 23rd, up to 52,000 people last week when, when we did this webinar, and today, as of 11 o'clock this morning, there are 63,000 Canadians who have been tested positive for COVID, 28,000 have recovered, and unfortunately now, uh, over 4,000 Canadians have uh, passed away from uh, COVID or its complications. 
Um, again, if we look at, at the impact by province, these are cases um, per province. And you can see the hardest hit country is, uh, sorry, province is Quebec at 34,000 um, cases, um, followed by Ontario. And again, larger provinces are going to have more cases just because of the size of the population. So then if we standardize these values to the number of people who live in the, in the province and we say, what are the cases per 100,000 people living? Well, we still see that Quebec um, has a high rate at 400 cases per 100,000. And, and again, if you remember the, the map I showed about the hardest hit countries in the world, um, Quebec in of itself as a province would rank as one of the, the top hardest hit regions um, in, in, the, in the world. And, um, but you can see other provinces like Ontario and Alberta having similar rates. Um, you know, the prairies, Manitoba and Saskatchewan continue to have uh, lower rates, although we see a little bit of a higher um, increase in Saskatchewan, which is now on par with British Columbia. Um, and we can see the East Coast, um, the hardest hit provinces is, is Nova Scotia. So um, today our, our, our segment is really focused on children with IBD and their families. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a sense of what proportion of uh, Canadians who are diagnosed with COVID are, are diagnosed mm -hmm. in different ages. So this is data from Canada, from Statistics Canada. Um, and I can see, and it was we, Stephanie Carroll to analyze this data back on uh, this morning. Um, you can see that 5% of all patients who are diagnosed with COVID are under the age of 19. So it represents a, a, a smallest portion, a quarter, 20 to 39, a third are 40 to 59, and a third are 60 or an older. If we start looking at this uh, in the context of being stratified um, by ages, all ages, you can see that most um, Canadians have mild symptoms, so they stay at home. 11% ICU, 3%, sorry, 11% hospitalized, 3% ICU, and 5% um, uh, have died who are test positive. Again, if we look at this from age, those under the age of 20 have done very well. The vast majority are at home. Um, very few have been hospitalized and, and, no, and no deaths. So that's really good news. Um, similarly, adults between the ages of 20 and 59 have done quite well as well with 6% hospitalized and less 1% mortality. And these numbers are, are better than many other countries in the Western world in terms of, of outcomes of, of COVID. Again, the hardest hit age group is our, our elderly population over the age of 60, where 20% um, end up in hospital and the case fatality rate is, is climbed up to 14%. And unfortunately, many of the people who have passed away um, in Canada um, have been in the uh, highest of, of ages, the most advanced ages, and, and in um, living in long-term care replacement. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, the question, why are provinces starting to relax physical distancing measures, lockdowns, letting kids go back to school in certain provinces? Um, and there are many different reasons for, for driving this. One of the interesting uh, factors is this whole concept of a reproduction number, um, which is this R0, and it gets to the whole point of if you're sick with COVID, how many people do you go and infect yourself? Um, and for the most part, if you have it, an R0 of less than one, what it means is if you're sick today, you'll infect less than one person. And, um, and in that scenario, we're actually gonna see a decline in the number of people diagnosed with COVID. In contrast, if the R0 is one, it means it's stable. The disease is stable, it means one person affects one person, that one person affects one other person, and so on and so on as those individuals um, recover, you're seeing a stable rate of disease. Um, what we don't wanna see is R0 greater than one because that's where we start to get exponential spread where one person infects two people, um, if it's an R0 of two, those two people infect another two people, and you can start to see that those values climb quite rapidly. So why is this important in the concept of, of why lockdowns are, are being kind of reduced? Well, Dr. David Fisman, who is an um, infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of Toronto, um, shared with me uh, this slide that he, um, this data that he created, and um, which actually looks at this reproduction number um, on this y-axis. Um, and you can see a reproduction number of one means it's stable. If it's under one, so below this red uh, dashed line, uh, it means that there's gonna be a decline in cases and above one um, means where we're gonna see exponential spread. And, and if we track this across time, going back to the beginning of March, all the way out to where we are today, and this is data specific to Alberta, we can see early on in the disease, or early on in the pandemic, we had very high um, R-naughts that was really driving this exponential rise. And that was driving a lot of the models that were being 
um, produced. And really right here, the factors that are driving all of those cases are really about the virus, viral factors, the fact that it was transmitted through respiratory droplets, so it's easy to pass from person to person, the fact that it had an incubation period on average around five days, so people would feel well for several days before they became sick and realized that they're sick and therefore they stop going to work or going out, um, and that the fact that we could actually see spread either because you're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So this is a very kind of sinister, sneaky virus that is very easy to spread because of its properties. So what happens to drop these numbers down? Well, really, this is now, while this is viral factors, this is what we do as personal factors, as societal factors. These are all the things that we're doing around reducing our contact. So even if a virus is very sneaky, if I'm at home when I'm sick and I don't get in contact with anybody, I'm not gonna pass on that virus to anyone else. So the key things that are driving things down are the contact rate between people, and that's being driven by you staying at home, by schools being closed down, by shops being closed down and so on, as well as geography or population density. Cities like New York City that are very, very densely populated where 5 million people go on public transportation are gonna have a much harder hit than um, a more country or rural um, area um, or city. Um, so in that context, what this has meant is it's bought time, time for our healthcare systems to prepare, time for us to get to the point where we can test people, um, identify their positive, do contact tracing, and isolate everyone in a while. And those are things that we can do in public health and in personal to drive these values down. And I suspect this little blip here was a relationship to um, the outbreak that we had in our meat plants in Alberta. Um, but the fact that the, this trends are happening across um, uh, the, the, the country is one of the rationales for things opening up. Um, and, and that's led us to have this discussion on Tuesday as, what is the implications to patients who have inflammatory bowel, bowel disease? Um, can, can we loosen up restrictions in the same way that provinces are doing? Um, and we had a very interesting discussion around those concepts. And the biggest difference between the discussion we had um, a few nights ago and the one that we had eight weeks ago is that last, uh, this week, we were armed with data that we didn't have when this pandemic started. Um, this is the secure registry. We brought in Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Brenner a few weeks ago to, to discuss it. You can track this um, database yourself. Um, as of this week, we now have 959 patients who have inflammatory bowel disease who have tested positive for COVID. Um, and you can look to see what's happening here. There, and we have reported cases all over the world. We have enough cases now that we can start to analyze what is the impact of people who've had bad outcomes versus those who've had good outcomes. Um, and like Dr. Brenner and Dr. Kaplan told us a few weeks ago, um, people who are on biologics look like they're doing well. We don't actually see a higher um, risk of complications with COVID for those patients who are on biologics. The group that we are most concerned about are people who are actively sick with the disease, particularly if they need to have prednisone to control the disease. The database suggests that those are the individuals who do worse with COVID. The other group that's a major risk factor is age. And if you look down here, this is kind of the distribution of all of these 950 cases stratified by ages. And you can see if you're 60 to 70, 70 to 80, or over the age of 80, your risk of bad outcomes like death, being in hospital, is much, much higher as, you're, as you get older than, than as you get younger. And in fact, if you look at this data, anyone under the age of 30, um, we haven't seen a single death reported in, in people who have IBD. And even um, outcomes like hospitalization and ICU are actually very, very low um, in this registry. And so that's the big, the big difference is that we're now armed with data eight weeks that we did eight weeks ago we didn't have this data so we can we can take that information and use that to help guide um, recommendations so let me just stop sharing my screen uh, here and I'll, I'll bring in Eric to come uh, back on on board as well um, just so that we can talk a little bit about um, the, um, the next step which are the recommendations and, and Eric just before I, I kind of go away and, and give you a chance to um, talk about the recommendations. I, I just wanted to make a, a last comment, um, which was just to reflect on the dialogue that we had two nights ago with the task force. And, and just to remind everybody, the, the task force is 
um, gastroenterologists, both adult and pediatric, uh, Anne Griffith and Dave Mack, um, who are going to be panelists later on, are, are on, on that task force representing pediatric gastroenterology, including Eric, adult gastroenterologist, infectious disease specialist. Um, and, and we had a nearly two hour dialogue around um, what we should be telling the IBD community in the context of, of relaxing physical distancing measures across the province in the context of data that we now have that we didn't have weeks or months ago. Weeks or months ago, we were basing our decisions on assumptions, on extrapolating from other viral infections. Um, and that really was important in informing the decisions that we have. And, and I have to be honest, that is probably one of the most complicated and powerful discussions I've had in my entire career as a gastroenterologist and academic. And uh, Eric, I'd be curious to get your, your thoughts on that. Um, and then and then I'll kind of fade away into the distance to let you take over. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think all the way along, we've sort of been uh, cautious and tried to protect patients, you know, tried to give recommendations to protect all of you and your family members and, and make sure that you stay well and make sure that you don't end up in hospital, make sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. I think what's changed is we've gotten good news. I mean, I, I can imagine a world where maybe we didn't get such good news in people with IBD and we, we learned that the drugs that we're using may cause harm if you get COVID-19. But so far, so good. We've really gotten good news, especially for younger people living with IBD. And um, I'm encouraged that we're able to kind of adapt that good news to some newer recommendations now and not be as, you know, as cautious and scary maybe as we were eight weeks ago. Uh, so that's sort of, I think, it, it's generally a good news story. Um, yeah, and the last comment I was going to make is that, I mean, this is dynamic. The reason that we're here every week is because information is rapidly evolving. Um, that database that, you know, um, the first case was reported on March 13th, and as of this week, we have nearly 1,000 people. It's going to go to thousands of people over the months, um, and we're going to be able to have much more granular understanding of things, and we're going to be here every week kind of updating these recommendations and, and helping the community. And with that... I'll sign off and let you kind of show our, our recommendations. Great. Thanks, Gil. And I just wanted to emphasize that uh, the website is now updated. So if you go to Crohn's and colitis.ca slash COVID-19, and sorry if I'm looking away, I'm looking at my other screen here, you'll see uh, the updated website. And if you go to guidance, assuming my internet works, It's loading. Website. I, mean, I think we we sent too many people to the website all at once. I think that's what just happened. Uh, so you'll see that uh, further down in the guidance section, there's reopening of schools and the economy, and you can learn more and read the recommendations here for yourself. But I'm going to show you sort of briefly what we're recommending uh, for people with IBD uh, in terms of the reopening and the uh, going back to school. Uh, you know, I think it's good news, grand reopening of everything, but it's not that good news, right? We, in Canada, we're doing this slowly. We're doing this very, very cautiously. And so it's not that everything is going to open up all of a sudden. Uh, we're paying very, very close attention, as are the public health officers and all the, all the, the politicians, uh, to, to monitor to make sure that we don't get a second spike. You know, I think we're expecting that this virus is not going to go away for the next few years, at least until we get a vaccine. And that, you know, a low simmer, I think Dr. Wilson said this at one point during the webinar a few weeks ago, a low simmer is what we're aiming for as people gradually get immunity and perhaps exposing the people who are um, at lowest risk for dying for, from COVID-19 and gradually get immunity uh, and not let it get to a boil again, right? Not let it spike up and affect our healthcare system. Uh, but we are slowly reopening, so we felt like we needed to make some new recommendations so that you could understand what we feel uh, should be done. So just a disclaimer, again, it's always based on the latest available evidence. We just don't know what's going to come out in the future, what risk factors might be there. We're still being very prudent and very cautious, and we're trying to protect you and your family members who have IBD as much as possible while allowing you some freedom to re-engage in life. And these recommendations don't replace the recommendations of your local public health agency or your doctor. So speak to your doctor if you have any questions. And then finally, we, we made uh, age-based recommendations this time because I think school, work, uh, young versus old, things are quite different depending on what age we're talking about. So I'll go through some of the age groups overall. 
So firstly, to start, this is a pediatric webinar, so we're going to start with children and teens under the age of 20. Uh, as Gil mentioned, children and teens have very, very mild symptoms. They are very unlikely to be hospitalized. In Canada so far, only about 2% were hospitalized, and less than 1% had to be admitted to the ICU. Uh, in the secure IBD registry, there were, uh, at the time, uh, last week, I guess, there were 31 patients. Now there's a few more, but of the 31 patients, three were on systemic steroids. Uh, remembering that steroids are a medicine that's the one medicine that we're a little bit concerned about in IBD, that steroids may be associated with worse outcomes for COVID-19. But for all the 31 patients who were under the age of 20, there were no deaths and no ICU admissions, even if they were on steroids. There were more patients under the age of 30, so that 20 to 30-year-old age group, there were quite a few more, and more were on steroids, and they all did well as well. So even the young patients on steroids seemed to do okay. Uh, the patients who were on immunosuppressive medications and biologics all did very well. Nobody needed to be hospitalized if they were in the childhood group. Uh, and so in general, it seems like COVID-19 may be equivalent in terms of risk for pediatric patients to the seasonal flu. And in fact, maybe a bit safer. I think more people uh, die seasonally, more children die seasonally from the flu than so far in Canada have died from COVID-19. It's early days. I'm being cautious. I'd be curious to see what Dr. Allen says about that during his presentation. But in general, you know, we go out and we engage in society with the seasonal flu, even when unfortunately most people don't get their flu shot, even though you should get your flu shot. Uh, most people don't. Uh, so we're not scared of the flu for children, I think the, the message would be the same for COVID-19. This is another really positive message that came out of uh, New South Wales, Australia. And uh, this was looking at before the closures in Australia, they tracked actually the number of infections in public schools in Australia. And there were actually 18 infected individuals in public schools, nine were students and nine were staff members who were in close contact in those schools to 735 students and 128 staff members. Uh, of all of those people that they were in close contact with, no teacher or staff member got COVID-19, and only two children of the 735 students exposed got COVID-19 after that. So you can see that with the, um, you know, the little dots. These are all the exposed people, and here's one person in this place in the school that got COVID-19, and there was one other person in there as well. So a very small number of uh, people a very small number of children are getting COVID-19 in schools after being exposed to uh, COVID-19 in their colleagues or their staff members. Uh, that's important because one of the major concerns that we had about COVID-19 in children is that children might be super spreaders. And what a super spreader is, remember that Gil spoke about the R-naught number a little bit earlier, a super spreader is somebody that might have an R-naught of nine or 10, so they, they might spread it to 10 other people. And the reason we were concerned about that in children is because children are have very mild or no symptoms, and we now know that COVID-19 can be spread even if you're asymptomatic. So, you know, we were concerned that there's all these mild children out there that are spreading it to a whole bunch of people. And if we reopen schools, it's going to be a major disaster. Uh, this New South Wales uh, Public Health report says that's not the case. It's one report. So again, I urge caution. We don't know. And we're going to see going forward for sure. There have been a number of countries that have reopened schools in the past week or two. Uh, we'll know more very shortly, I think. But this is an encouraging report for sure. So in general, for children and teens, our recommendation are that it's safe to go back to school as long as you're following public health guidance. Uh, and what we recommend is that uh, don't send your child back to school if your child is newly, uh, newly diagnosed, has severe active inflammation, is taking steroids, and the doses really, the doses of prednisone are shown there, has moderate or severe malnutrition, uh, those would be times when you don't send your child to school. Uh, you know, it's really the steroids and the active inflammation that we're most, most worried about. Um, moderate or severe malnutrition is rare, but it does happen in children at diagnosis. And then what we're recommending is that you try to shield uh, your child if that's the case. And by shielding, what we mean is that all household members who live with your child should employ good hand hygiene and other strategies to reduce transmission of COVID-19, such as um, adhering to physical distancing and cleaning the house really well. And then where possible, household members should engage in physical distancing from your child, so maintaining a distance of at least two meters. We say where possible because that's obviously very hard with siblings 
you know, to do. And if it's a young child, we understand the, the, the concerns about doing that. But if possible, especially if somebody else in the household has been exposed to COVID-19 at school or at work, please stay away from the child who is sick, essentially. Um, household members should adhere to public health and physical distancing recommendations outside of their home, like of trying to avoid in-person meetings, uh, modifying their work duties to allow for physical distancing, using services for vulnerable people like the early opening work hours, uh, early opening pharmacy and, and grocery store hours, uh, and clean the residence as best as possible. And what we're recommending is that you wait until your child is feeling better and has tapered down on the prednisone to below 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. Uh, and this may take some time. So, you know, by the time it, remission is induced and the child is feeling better and the inflammation has gone away, it is not a matter of days after starting a medicine. It could be a matter of weeks or even months. And so please take your time in sending a sick child back to school. Speak to your doctor before doing so. Um, for the other recommendations for children is essentially if there's an outbreak of COVID-19 in your child's school, keep them home from school for at least 14 days and speak to your local public health office for recommendations and, and further instructions. And if your child has other illnesses, other things that might put them at risk for severe COVID-19, speak to your, your doctor about that before sending them to the school. So don't forget that it's not just about the IBD. We know that people who have respiratory illnesses, cardiac illnesses, diabetes may be at risk for severe COVID-19. So please speak to your child's doctors uh, before sending your child to school. So adults age 20 to 64, again, the bottom line is from the secure IBD register, we know that they generally do very well, even if they're on immunosuppressives and biologics. So we've recommended that if you're healthy and in remission, follow your local public health guidance. But if your local public health office is saying you can gradually start to go back to work, we're happy with you gradually going back to work, even if you're on an immunosuppressive medication or a biologic. The exception, again, is steroids and severe active inflammation. So if you're in the middle of a flare, if your doctor has told you you have moderate or severe active inflammation, if you're on steroids, more than 20 milligrams per day of prednisone, if your doctor has told you you're malnourished or you're underweight, or if you're on TPN, intravenous nutrition through a central line, please stay home. Um, if you have other comorbidities that put you at increased risk for severe COVID-19, as I mentioned, you should also consider staying home. And then finally, seniors uh, is a little bit more difficult because we know this is the group that is most at risk for uh, severe COVID-19 and death and that the risk increases with age. So remember, it's not a sudden at 65 or at 60, you're at more risk. This is a gradual thing, right? So a 60-year-old maybe at is at lower risk than an 85-year-old uh, and a 50-year-old is probably at greater risk than a 40 or a 30-year-old. But it's a continuum and you have to consider all of that when you're making your decisions about whether or not to go out. We recommend for seniors to take a more cautious approach uh, and consider your risk factors carefully, consider what, you're, you know, what you want to tolerate in terms of your risk, and also continue, uh, consider continuing self-isolation, again, if you're on prednisone, severe active inflammation, if you're malnourished, or if you have other comorbidities. In general, for seniors, we recommend speaking to your doctor uh, before making any decisions and getting their recommendations. And remember, what we know is changing very quickly, uh, and these recommendations should supplement but not replace the recommendations made by your doctor or your local public health authority. All right, so with that, uh, we're going to introduce our speakers. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Upton Allen. Uh, Dr. Allen is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto, and he's chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at SickKids. Dr. Allen is also a senior associate scientist in the Research Institute at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, his primary appointment is in the Division of Infectious Diseases Department of Pediatrics at the Hospital for Sick Children, and he's also cross-appointed at the Institute of, of Health Policy Management and Evaluation uh, at the University of Toronto. He's interim director of the Transplant and Regenerative Medicine Center for the, at the Hospital for Sick Children uh, and primary consultant for the transplant team at SickKids, and as well is, is nationally and internationally recognized for his research and clinical care in the field of EV, EBV-related post-transplant lymphoma proliferative disorder, or PTLD. Uh, he has over 300 publications, several book track chapters, and 190 scientific abstracts, as well as many 
peer-reviewed grant. So really a, a giant in the field of pediatric infectious diseases internationally. Uh, second up is uh, Dr. Ben Gold. Benjamin Gold is a partner, a pediatric gastroenterologist at GI Care for Kids, LLC, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which is a 15-member group of pediatric gastroenterologists who care for about 1,250 children and adolescents with IBD. Uh, ben is also the co-lead uh, for GI Care for Kids of the Improved Care Now Network, which is a quality uh, improvement network run in the U.S., um, ben trained at SickKids in Toronto. He did his pediatric GI fellowship. And so he's long been known as an honorary Canadian uh, amongst the Canadian pediatric GI community. He also has uh, a Canadian born daughter who is very proud of her Canadian citizenship, I understand. He was also apparently giving a uh, grand rounds at, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, un unfortunately on 9 11 and uh, was forced to room with Dr. Bernstein, who's very well known to people in Winnipeg. Uh, and I say forced, not because Dr. Bernstein is difficult to room with, right, right, Ben? We won't talk about that. Uh, next up is Dr. Edwin DeZoten. Ed uh, completed his medical school at the University of Illinois in Chicago, a residency at Chicago Hospital Colorado, and fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP. He's currently the director of the IBD Center at the Children's Hospital of Colorado and associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado. He's also, I, I should have said, well, so Ed is chair of the NASPGAN IBD committee and Dr. Gold is actually president-elect of NASPGAN, the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology. So I welcome you both uh, to the webinar today. And finally, two names that many of you in the audience are familiar with, Dr. Ann Griffiths and Dr. David Mack. Uh, Dr. Griffiths is Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto and co-director of the SickKids IBD Centre. She served as head of the Division of Gastroenterology uh, at, in the Department of Pediatrics from 2008 to 2015 and is now co-director of the IBD Centre. Under her leadership, the IBD program has played an important role in IBD genetic research since 96, 1996. Um, and she has decades of experience treating children and adolescents with IBD. She also runs... Uh, with Dr. Mack, the Canadian Children IBD Network, a national cohort of children with IBD, which is advancing our knowledge of the origins of IBD and how to best treat children with IBD. And finally, my colleague, Dr. Mack, uh, and my boss, him being director of the CHEO IBD Center uh, at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Mack is also a professor of pediatrics. He trained at the University of Ottawa and did his fellowship at SickKids in gastroenterology uh, and has been back in Ottawa after a short stint in the United States uh, back in Ottawa since about the year 2001. And he was my mentor when I got there as a resident in 2002. That shows how old we all are um, and continues to be my mentor to this day. Uh, at the CHEO IBD Center, we treat about 350 children with IBD. Uh, and he is instrumental in running clinical research and microbiome research uh, with the University of Ottawa Basic Science Lab at CHEO. So thank you all for joining. It was a long introduction, but there's a lot to say about all of you. I appreciate you joining today. Uh, so I think we're going to start with Dr. Allen's presentation, and we'll move on from there. So if we can just get Dr. Allen's slides up as soon as Sarah is able to. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Allen. You're still muted. Um, sorry about this. Can you unmute, try to unmute yourself if possible? Great. Can you hear oh, me now? We yes, we can okay. hear you now. Well, it's really great to be among friends. Um, and uh, uh, I work uh, very closely. Um, with uh, Anne, so it's uh, really great to see her. Um, and of course, um, my good friend, Dr. Gold, um, who we were neighbors on um, uh, in Toronto on Elm Street, and uh, and then of course, um, Dr. Mack. So it, it's really great uh, to be uh, with you today to focus on uh, a pediatric perspective related to COVID, uh, and I will uh, put this in the context of uh, children with chronic diseases. This is the outline of what I'll present over the next uh, 10 or so minutes. Um, I'll make some introductory remarks relating to COVID and sorry with respect to the uh, great pandemic of 1918-19. Uh, 
focus on the epidemic curve then and now, uh, get into some conversations um, with you about uh, the coronavirus family in general, transmission issues, clinical presentation, and then get into risk factors. And then, of course, um, end with some comments about uh, children with weakened immune systems in the uh, context of COVID. This slide is actually from 1918-19, but it could have been from New York in uh, 2020. And this showed what happened at that time when the healthcare system really was quite overwhelmed and individuals had to be placed in uh, buildings other than hospitals. And this uh, could have happened in New York. And at, at that time, as it is now, the concern was, um, how does one try to flatten the curve so as not to overwhelm the healthcare system? In other words, what, what one wants to have occurring uh, are mounds and not peaks. In this regard, uh, in 1918-19, uh, in various parts of the world, this uh, data are from uh, the UK, that actually uh, show that uh, there were three peaks um, uh, at that time. But in other individuals, uh, uh, other um, uh, countries and regions, there were not necessarily three peaks as the data show here. And, um, Philadelphia uh, peak, and then it was pretty flat after that. San Francisco, a primary peak, and then a second uh, peak. Uh, New York, uh, a, a bit of a peak, and then uh, flattening out as well. So what one wants, perhaps, is something like Philadelphia 1918-19 with a peak, and then perhaps um, a, a significant flattening out after that. And that's what we would want now for COVID, uh, which um, will be the focus of the presentation today. Now, the coronavirus family, there are uh, seven that affect uh, humans. The ones uh, highlighted in red are the ones that we currently um, are seeing on a seasonal basis um, that we refer to as the, the so-called regular coronaviruses. The uh, ones that are problematic for us are MERS, um, uh, SARS coronavirus 1, which was responsible for that uh, problematic outbreak in 2002 2003, and then SARS coronavirus 2, which is responsible for COVID. Uh, so, in uh, simplified terms, uh, uh, SARS CoV 1 and SARS CoV 2, they're really like cousins, they're really closely related. And this um, is meant to show a cartoon of the spike protein of the coronavirus that hitches onto uh, the surface of uh, the uh, cells in the body as it tries to gain entry to cells. Uh, and in that regard, it uh, uses a receptor that we'll call, that is called ACE2. And just remember that name because I'll come back to ACE2 later on when we talk about uh, gastrointestinal tract um, uh, involvement. Now, the spread, you've seen uh, many slides like this one, uh, the magic distance of, uh, of uh, six feet. Um, beyond six feet, uh, the viruses that are transmissible uh, more, most commonly would be the airborne uh, viruses uh, such as measles. It does not mean that other viruses, that like coronavirus, couldn't have the occasional droplet that goes a little bit further than it ought to go. But in general terms, uh, we're looking at uh, a droplet transmission uh, within uh, six feet. Uh, but there's some individuals who are uh, very um, uh, prolific at their capacity to spread, and we all have to be aware of that, that in the environment would be lots of um, viruses depending on uh, the inoculum, the amount of virus that landed on a given service, uh, but also the survival in the environment. So the virus, um, uh, SARS coronavirus 2, that causes COVID, is viable up to 72 hours after being placed on stainless steel and plastic. It's viable for up to four hours after being placed on copper, up to a day after uh, being on cardboard. Uh, it may be viable in uh, some aerosols um, for uh, three uh, hours. 
Um, now, what we do know, I'm going to move uh, from this text slide to these two slides, which basically contain the same information, is that when you look at the survival of the virus on different uh, surfaces like paper, uh, printing paper, uh, tissue paper, wood, cloth, and glass, uh, within three hours, you can't pick it up on printing paper anymore, the uh, same as tissue paper. On wood, uh, it takes out up to two days before you can no longer pick up the virus. The same for cloth. And then glass, it's uh, a bit longer. And then when you look at uh, other you know, things that we use, like uh, money on a bank note, um, it's uh, up to four days. Uh, uh, and stainless steel, Again, uh, um, four days and more, it's up to a week. Uh, plastic uh, can be quite longer. Some variation between studies, but I think you're, you're seeing the picture that for some surfaces like stainless steel, uh, plastic, it uh, will survive longer on those. The other observation is that on the outer surface, the outer layer of mass, that are used, for example, in the healthcare setting, the uh, virus tends to survive a bit longer and the outer uh, layer of the mask, interestingly, compared with the inner layer of the mask. In terms of presentation, I'll uh, focus um, on this over the next few slides, so I won't dwell on this um, particular slide, but we know that uh, symptoms have evolved over the last um, uh, several uh, weeks um, uh, to the point where uh, we're now looking at atypical uh, manifestations uh, which were not prominent initially, like changes in uh, smell or taste, um, more gastrointestinal involvement uh, than before. Um, looking at the GI manifestations that we've seen in COVID-19, uh, diarrhea is um, uh, quite common. Abdominal pain is common. Nausea and vomiting is common. Uh, hemorrhagic enterocolitis, uh, just case report, that's uh, very rare. Uh, one may see uh, elevated uh, liver enzymes. Um, they're not terribly high. Uh, the um, uh, bottom line is that um, uh, more and more information uh, is being uh, gathered with respect to the gaseous gastrointestinal manifestations of COVID, so we uh, definitely need to stay uh, tuned. But I thought I'd share with you this slide, and it's not as complicated as it, as it looks. And essentially, this is a study looking at the, that receptor that I made reference to, it's called the ACE2 receptor, and it's where the virus um, attaches to the cell so that it can enter the cell and replicate. So having the ACE2 receptor allows the virus to enter. And in this particular experiment, um, they looked at the, uh, the presence of the receptor on various cells in the body. The title says oral mucosa because that was the title of the paper, but they looked at uh, various cells in the body. And what you can see is that the, in terms of the uh, presence of the ACE2 receptor in the lung, uh, relative to the colon, the lung is in the middle. The colon is, is at the high end in terms of um, the presence of this receptor. Uh, if you look at the uh, oral mucosa, you can see uh, the presence of uh, the uh, receptor as well. So the bottom line uh, is, from this slide, is that it really does appear that the receptor for COVID-19 is present uh, in uh, uh, the cells, at least on the surface of cells, of the oral mucosa all the way through to the colon, and it might be more prevalent than in the case of the lung, and we often think about COVID as a lung disease, and in fact, we may want to think more broadly as we are doing now. Uh, we, I'm not going to dwell on this. This has been uh, addressed earlier. The bottom line is that uh, as far as the age distribution of uh, COVID-19 cases in Canada, it's account for about 5% of uh, cases that are occurring uh, in uh, Canada. Um, the United Kingdom um, data recently uh, released, I uh, just wanted to highlight um, not a lot of uh, cases of um, uh, kids being admitted uh, because of 
um, liver gastrointestinal disease, uh, but it certainly um, uh, is something that um, uh, is being captured uh, in registries and uh, more information uh, to follow in this regard. When we look at um, some of the initial data that characterized uh, COVID uh, in children, uh, here's a, one of the earlier studies they looked at over 2,000 children uh, with COVID in, in China. Uh, and the, most of the children uh, who uh, were uh, seen to be getting into trouble uh, were the younger kids. Uh, the um, preschool the children and infants were more, more likely to have severe manifestations uh, compared with uh, older children. And this slide, um, Again, um, uh, there's more complicated than what I want you to focus on. And I just want you to focus on the kids who are uh, less than one to, uh, to five, and they accounted for a greater proportion of severe uh, disease uh, and critical uh, disease compared with the other uh, age groups. So it does appear that the younger kids seem to be um, uh, more likely to get into trouble compared with their older counterparts. But um, we obviously need more data. Uh, these are data looking at uh, the characteristics and outcomes of uh, regular coronavirus infection um, in children and what is the role of um, other viruses and the immunocompromised state, a uh, study done by one of my colleagues um, uh, in the United States. And what um, uh, the group showed, Janet England and her colleagues from Seattle, were that younger age, underlying lung disease, an immunocompromising state, a respiratory co-pathogen such as RSV, were associated with more severe disease in children. In this regard, RSV, which is the respiratory syncytial virus, that typically runs between November and mid-March or so in, in, uh, in North America, uh, would increase the risk of severe uh, lung disease in a COVID-positive patient by greater than five times. And so this is of some concern as one thinks of next fall and the potential that we could have the coming together of COVID as well as RSV and possibly flu it's something for us to uh, bear in mind. And in the next uh, slide here, I'm showing you uh, risk factors for severe disease in influenza illness. And we don't have a lot of data to go by to guide us with respect to COVID. But what we uh, do know uh, is that uh, there are certain risk factors that have been identified as being a problem in uh, individuals uh, with influenza, and we've used that to guide us uh, to some degree. Uh, and so uh, this is, we can have some more discussion about it, but this is what we've used to guide us as far as the likelihood of individuals having uh, problems with, uh, with COVID. Now, as far as kids uh, with weakened immune systems, this has been alluded to before, trying to create a shield around them. We call that in infectious diseases and public health cocooning uh, effect, essentially trying to create a protective barrier around these individuals so that people don't bring infection into their inner circle, so to speak. It's likely that kids with weakened immune systems might have higher virus load, a greater uh, tendency for transmission possibly, prolonged shedding, uh, likelihood that that might happen, and of course, the risk of severe disease. We'll have to deal with the potential that these individuals might not have been able to mount adequate antibody responses and as such perhaps might be at risk of reinfection. So this is something that we'll have to um, keep a, um, an eye on as we move forward. So I know there's a lot to cover. We'll have a lot to talk about, but I'll stop there and then we will uh, get back to you in the question and answer section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen. That was really informative, really useful. Um, so next up, we're going to have Dr. Desoten and Dr. Gold uh, provide more of a, well, for Dr. Desoten, the North American perspective uh, from NASPGAN, and then Dr. Gold uh, will provide a little bit of information of what's happening in Georgia, which is treating reopening a little bit differently than we are in Canada. 
But first, Ed, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Benchmall and, and Dr. Kaplan. I'm uh, really happy to, to talk to you today about um, the uh, SPN recommendations. These recommendations were actually initially uh, developed for pediatric gastroenterologists to uh, provide some guidance as to what to do with COVID-19. Um, let's see if I can move this forward. So the recommendations that we have here today, I will just touch on the points that uh, that we found uh, would be helpful for patients uh, like yourselves who, or, or family members of patients. Um, not moving forward. There we go. So uh, we, uh, as a group, um, identified multiple different sources to uh, develop our guidelines for our um, for our um, physicians and providers. We really feel it's critical that we all utilize uh, well-sourced information. The World Health Organization, uh, the United States CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, uh, Crohn's and Colitis Canada has a beautiful website that uh, you should take some time to look at. And then uh, GI Kids, which is a uh, run by the Naspigan Foundation, and Naspigan uh, has some excellent advice and uh, concepts that can be uh, utilized for all of our patients. So, if we start with some of the patient recommendations, the first thing that we are recommending is that patients should not stop their medication. I utilize an asterisk here because I want everyone to consider talking to their um, physicians about uh, their medications and whether or not there's any need to make a change. But um, out of hand, the idea of stopping your medications is not a good idea. Um, we have, as Dr. Benchmal noted, um, we, we do see that patients who have severe uh, inflammation or uh, are active inflammation may be at higher risk of complications of COVID or, or uh, of um, developing COVID-19. Things that IBD patients should do are things that many of you have heard already. Uh, avoid close contact with others that are sick. Uh, washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and using or using hand sanitizer if soap's not available. Uh, and we shoot for a hand sanitizer that's 60% ethanol or greater. It's key not to touch your nose, your eyes, your mouth uh, if you haven't washed your hands. Obviously, if you've washed your hands, then uh, that's the time to do that. Um, the, uh, the point here also is when we talk about face masks, in the United States, uh, many states are now uh, requiring or recommending the use of face masks one of the things that face masks can do is increase the amount of times you touch your face. Um, and so it's something to be cognizant of when you are wearing a face mask that you're much more likely to be touching your face at those times. So um, uh, to just remind yourself not to do that. And then uh, follow social distancing as per your local government. Um, many places are uh, requiring or uh, limiting travel for the time being, uh, specifically uh, international travel. Um, and then um, uh, wearing face masks as per your local government. Um, social distancing, as was described uh, so nicely previously, um, is one way to avoid uh, contact with the virus. So then the question comes, does IUD increase your risk of developing COVID-19? And, and really what we uh, know from this is um, what uh, Dr. Benchmall and Kaplan had spoken about before. Uh, there was a, there's a, a large committee uh, you, through the International Organization for the Study of IBD, where they uh, sat down and discussed what are the concerns of different medications, what are the concerns with IBD. And we utilize these guidelines to try to define some simple, uh, simple guidelines for our physicians and their patients. Um, currently, there's no, no evidence that, uh, to suggest that IBD increases your risk of developing COVID-19. That being said, we do have to consider the fact that um, that uh, severe inflammation can uh, can play may possibly play a role in uh, your susceptibility. Other health factors do play a greater role in increasing your risk of severe disease, including lung issues, heart disease, and diabetes. 
But then is there any medication that I should stop to avoid developing COVID-19? Currently, those the recommendations are that none of the medications that are uh, other than um, prednisone, which has been discussed previously, have been identified as possible risk factors. Um, other biologics or other similar uh, medications are on the list of medications that should be continued. And your risk of developing inflammation due to coming off of them is, is greater. Um, then the question, is there any medication that I should stop if I develop COVID-19? This is an area where speaking with your physician is critical. Um, there are recommendations that certain medications be uh, held when you, uh, if you do develop COVID-19, although we don't know the results of holding those medications yet. Again, it's, a, it's the same uh, uh, story that, that you've been hearing previously, which is that we just don't have the data to state one way or the other. Um, although the current recommendations are that if you are on steroids, weaning your steroids is uh, uh, beneficial and, um, and that um, you may need to consider coming off of medications somewhat as, such as, um, as uh, azathioprine or 6 procaptopurine with the Trexate and some of these other medications that are immunosuppressant. You know, um, but these, again, need to be discussed with your physician. I'd like to step into now is um, an area that we don't discuss very frequently, and especially we don't deal with that much, uh, but we are dealing with now with the, with the pandemic. We know that up to 40% of our patients uh, with IBD have felt depression and or anxiety. And the feelings of anxiety or feelings of isolation, fear, lack of interpersonal connections, all these things are what we are going through with quarantine as well as social distancing. And this is a critical component of our health. So we talk about what are the things that can be done. It's important that parents talk to their children about their thoughts and concerns, asking the question of, you know, what are you thinking? Where, what have you heard about COVID-19? And what are your concerns? It's a very simple question, uh, but you might open up quite a bit of information. It's critical to turn off media and, and news for extended periods during the day. Um, realistically, the, the news is not changing that quickly. And, uh, and so, um, being focused on it, keeping it on at all times may not be the way to uh, decrease your stress. Set up a schedule. Um, scheduling is, is helpful. It can give people uh, something to look forward to, something to look at as the next step in their day, um, especially when uh, they're missing school, they're missing their friends, they're missing, missing their, uh, their playtime uh, that they uh, normally had scheduled. And then begin regular stress management practices. Um, there are multiple uh, um, websites that are available to, uh, to use stress management, and I'll have a slide after this that'll talk about those. Um, it's interesting, I have four children, and um, there are probably 20 different sites that are available for or, uh, apps that can be used for mindfulness, and, um, and each one of them uh, really fi finds that a different one is beneficial to them. So if one doesn't work for you, consider looking at others and, and uh, trying them out it can be quite relaxing and, and uh, calming uh, during this difficult time. So, and then uh, for caregivers, it's important to, to focus on your own de-stressing, whether that's cooking a favorite meal, taking time taking for yourself, relaxing, going for a walk away from the family. Um, these are all areas where um, it's important for the caregivers to, to find ways to cope with the uh, isolation. And then connecting with friends and family. Well, we may not be able to, uh, run out and hug our family members. It is critical to utilize uh, uh, video conferencing in other ways to keep in touch, to uh, make sure our kids are staying in touch with their family members and friends. Um, and uh, uh, at this time, it, it, we are having so much more screen time. And I know as, as pediatricians and physicians, we talk a lot about not having too much screen time. This is an area where screen time is important. And then getting outside. If you can, enjoy the fresh air, getting outside, uh, maintaining social distancing, but also um, being in the fresh air can be very refreshing. Staying active, running, uh, or um, uh, being active in that way might be, uh, can be a very uh, beneficial practice. So these are some of the resources that we uh, provide. Um, GI Kids, as I spoke about before, has multiple resources, lots of information, um, stress management sites, Headspace, Mind, Smiling Mind, Mindfulness Coach, uh, 
these are all different apps that can be used. Um, as I said, everybody's different. I have four children. They all seem to like a different one, um, but they uh, can be very beneficial. Then making sure you're following with Crohn's and Colitis Connect Canada, you can look at Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America and, um, and the NASPAN website. Um, and then there are some, some other guidelines or some other uh, informational sites here uh, where we look at talking to our kids about COVID-19. There's some nice information on how to do that uh, if there are if you're finding it difficult or finding a difficult way uh, difficult to to really get into a good discussion. And I'm happy to take questions in the future or uh, at the end of this uh, if there's any questions specifically about the United States and how we are dealing with COVID, uh, please feel free to ask. Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you so much, um, Eric and Gil, um, and uh, my um, still um, family, former um, uh, tr family when I was trainee, and I still think of them as my extended family, um, Ann Griffiths, David Mack, um, uh, and Eric, um, who has been a, um, a, uh, a wonderful person to work with as he's counselor and I've been uh, assuming the role of uh, president of NASPGAN. Um, I've got an interesting task tonight, and I'm trying to do this very quickly um, to talk about um, COVID as Georgia opens up. Um, we um, are uh, an interesting um, uh, state, if you will, um, uh, and although we are part of the Southern United States. So I entitled this Perspectives of COVID-19 and Pediatric IBD from the South either of the border for the whole US or Southern United States. Um, what I'd like to go over very quickly is to talk about the uh, frightening numbers of coronavirus infections in the US and particularly the Southern US. And then what we're doing um, at, at Jacket for Kids, um, which is part of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, um, both pre and post, in particular touching on telehealth, um, our infusions. Uh, again, one of the points that's been made by all the speakers um, and, um, and I really outlined well, both in the um, uh, Crohn's Colitis Canada, um, as well as um, in our NASPGAN and uh, Crohn's Colitis um, uh, Foundation in the US, but maintaining your medications, and it's important to maintain health and general. And I'm really glad that Ed touched on the mental health um, aspect um, of this. And then what happens when uh, uh, you begin loosening safe distancing and opening business? I think the biggest issue that we're facing in the U.S. is the balance between um, understanding um, good public health, um, transmission of infections, um, uh, and how to um, flatten the curve, which was outlined very well by um, Dr. Allen, versus how do you maintain the economy. Um, I am not even going to touch on the jobless rate um, uh, dramatically rising here in the U.S. Um, and uh, to uh, use a phrase that one of my mentors used to me, what's happening in the South, which is really an uncontrolled experiment um, without informed consent. Um, um, because when uh, Brian Kemp, the governor of the state of Georgia announced that he was um, loosening uh, uh, the safe distancing regulations, his task force, and in particular, the mayor of the city of Atlanta, his COVID-19 task force, which includes CDC and public health representatives from the state of Georgia, all were completely unaware um, that he was gonna make this announcement. Um, and now we're scrambling. Um, today in the United States, and I was given permission by Mina and the organizers, Kate um, and Sarah, um, till five to get this in. Um, and I'm usually one of those who tweaks my slides till the last minute anyway, um, but, it's rather scary when it's changing by um, uh, almost the day, if not the hour. Um, and I think Gil in his presentation gave a wonderful overview of what's been happening in the world, at least initially since your very first, it's still staggering. You've already had eight of these webinars, but 1.1 uh, um, million cases in the US, 70,000 deaths, we just crossed that. And here's a map of the United States in particular, um, focusing on those states that are dark. Um, and you can see the arrow points to Georgia for those of you who um, forgot your geography and where Georgia sits, which is right above the Florida. 
And we happen to have a governor and Florida has a governor, both of whom have decided that they're going to go ahead and do what they want to in their states. Um, but I promised my wife I would not be political. Um, when you look at the specific epidemiology in Georgia, um, this is uh, cases by county. So in the US, um, we have counties, you all have um, we uh, provinces. Um, uh, and um, if you look at this where the arrows pointed, that's actually where Atlanta um, is made up. Atlanta is about a 6 million um, in uh, population. If you count the three major counties that overlap Atlanta and you can see um, our numbers are rather staggering. So in Georgia, 29,600 cases, uh, 1,258 case, uh, cases. And that's of May 6th. They haven't published the May 7th numbers, and that won't be published till tonight. So what are we doing? Um, and there are a number of us within our group who have national positions within organizations. So try to stay in touch with um, what's going on nationally and then use that um, because we want to be evidence-based and science-based in what we do. Um, Shelly Dykes, who's one of my partners, is a national um, uh, uh, a member of Improved Care Now Collaborative, um, for example, um, and then me as part of being NASPI and president-elect. Um, I also have a, a cross appointment at CDC, so um, in foodborne and diarrheal diseases branch, so I'm actively trying to make sure that we're all singing the same song, if you will. Um, we are, um, oops, um, we are um, four, 15 full-time um, uh, um, pediatric gastroenterologists. We have a number of satellite locations, um, five advanced practice practitioners. We have one that's specifically dedicated to our IBD patients. We have our own full service endoscopy center, as well as the uh, more challenging patients that we do at, uh, at the hospital. Um, 38,000 patient visits in 2018. Um, we actually broke 40,000 for 2019. Um, we have a number of clinical trials that we're doing and we're part of the ICN uh, um, IV quality improvement registry. What's important to recognize also, and I think this is critical, is we're integrated into an electronic medical record. Epic is the platform we use and we've been so for now seven years. Um, that's a critical part of understanding epidemiology of disease um, uh, and has been used in, um, at least with respect to um, handling um, COVID in our practice um, and Children's Healthcare Atlanta. Post coronavirus, um, and I would say after March 2020, we um, were already talking about getting into telehealth. So that's been up and running. Um, we actually, uh, today, there were uh, close to 320 patients between the providers. Um, we're still practicing safe distancing, so there is only one provider in the office at the time to be there for the infusions, um, and um, one a physician in the office um, at our main office. We closed our satellites and are keeping them closed. That's responsible for outpatient visits. We are still doing our infusions, um, uh, uh, and we actually infuse um, children and adults. Um, again, one of the things that uh, there was some preliminary data that came out of Italy um, uh, and uh, Spain with respect to um, IBD and particularly those on the biologics and um, uh, COVID. And I think what the Secure IBD Registry, which has been a phenomenal project, has shown is that, in fact, um, uh, keeping your infusions up, maintaining your health is important. And we're continuing to do this. Um, we use a process called pre-visit planning, um, and we're still active, and we have an electronic medical record for all of our children that the parents are able to read ahead of time before their visit. So maintaining immunizations, medication adherence, et cetera. Um, one little proviso about that, and maybe um, Dr. Allen will be uh, 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 proud of me for saying this. I think one of the things, Sally Goza, who is the current president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, and he actually a uh, pediatrician here in Georgia. Um, uh, the pediatricians are really struggling with making sure that people get to the office to get their healthcare checks and get their immunizations. Um, the concern is that there's a whole lot of other viruses um, that are, um, and infections that if you don't maintain your immunizations that um, we may be in trouble with. Um, currently, if you um, follow the news, at least here in the United States, there are three phases that the CDC and the White House, and they haven't varied, for, uh, varied from that um, in terms of a model for opening. 
And Georgia has not met any of those, including phase one. In particular, the apex of the curve was not met either with new infections or death. So yet despite this, um, Brian Kemp, and if you can see um, the headlines here, Georgia governor disregards Trump criticism, moves ahead with plans to reopen. Kemp dismisses uh, ridiculous criticism of Georgia. And I'm not to be left behind. Other Southern states are doing the same thing. My wife, who's an elementary school teacher and is still um, doing virtual teaching, the school closes um, in two weeks and schools have not opened in the state of Georgia. Um, uh, so I really appreciated that um, a bit, um, particularly from what um, uh, was discussed in terms of recommendations from Crohn's Colitis Canada. Um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens um, as universities and, and schools are talking about the fall, because in Georgia, school starts um, in the beginning of August. Um, so we continue to follow science and safe distance guidelines. And that was what the question that Eric posed to me when he asked me to talk. And we're gonna continue to do that until at least we have evidence um, that um, uh, we're either nearing the peak and or we've got the population-based testing that's available um, uh, in Georgia. Um, without going through the slide, which adds the Crohn's Colitis Foundation, there's a number of wonderful resources. And I think it's important for parents and patients who do get on the internet um, to look at that you go to vetted resources, WHO, CDC, Crohn's Colitis Canada, um, and then GI Kids, which is the foundation part of NASP, again, all have vetted resources about what to do. Um, and so with that, um, I'll open it up for questions and turn it back over to the moderator. Great, thank you very much, Ben and Ed, really appreciate it. So we'll get everybody on the screen on the webcam now. And I apologize, apparently uh, there are situations if you're watching on your phone that you can't see all the webcams. Uh, if we don't have a slide up, it might go blank. Uh, so just be aware, you'll, you'll hear our voices, I guess you don't need to see our faces necessarily. Um, so I'd like to start with a question to Dr. Allen, if he is up. Uh, there we go. Yeah, there you are. And then we're just missing Dr. Mack on the webcam, but we'll get him going. So, Dr. Allen, thanks again for for joining us. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on the the Crohn's and colitis recommendations uh, about guidance about going back to school for pediatric patients. I think it was generally quite positive about the, that children can can return to school safely uh, as long as they don't have severe active disease and aren't on steroids. Uh, do you agree with that recommendation? Can you comment? Oh, and I think you're muted still. Sorry, it Dr. Allen. Agree, um, oh, there we go. Comment, um, uh, but um, but that, that said, um, uh, I think it's really important um, to be plugged into the recommendations coming from the local public health units um, in a particular area. So that I think it's really important. Um, and that will influence um, uh, decision making with respect to um, uh, uh, going back to school, of course, um, uh, and also um, uh, be plugged into what's happening with respect to outbreaks that might be occurring. Uh, and and it, as we open up schools, there are going to be some situations where there are going to be more and more cases that might be located in some schools versus the next. So one needs to be plugged into public health. So in principle, I, I, I do agree, um, but I think uh, it's a cautious return, uh, so to speak. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one difference maybe from uh, the U.S. experience, with, with due respect to Ben, um, you know, I think our politicians are deciding on opening schools with good coordination with our public health officers uh, and public health agencies in various provinces. Uh, which may not necessarily be the case in some U.S. states. Am I correct, Ben? Yes, um, and it's, it seems to be state to state. I mean, there's there's been coalitions of governors um, uh, who are um, alike in terms of what they're doing for their states, um, particularly in the Northeast, which has been a, um, an epicenter. Um, uh, uh, the governors in the South aren't talking to one another, but yet they seem to be doing similar things in terms of a different than the rest of the 
the country. So it's the difference between having sort of a formalized centralized approach, which has from a public health perspective, I think is optimal um, to an individualized approach. Great. Um, and maybe my next question to uh, Dr. Griffiths and Dr. Mack, who are Canadian representatives on the COVID uh, IBD task force, the, the Crohn's and colitis COVID-19 task force. Uh, Anne and Dave, based on your experience of children with IBD, uh, I mean, firstly, have you seen any cases of COVID-19 in any of your patients? Uh, and in either case, how do you feel that the children are doing when they get COVID-19 based on our knowledge of the secure IBD registry and other factors? So uh, as far as we know, none of the children or teenagers uh, that we follow at SickKids uh, have tested positive for the coronavirus yet or had the COVID-19 illness none at all as far as we know um, and it's certainly as everyone has said tonight it's reassuring that around the world when any children or teenagers acquire the virus it seems to be a mild illness and that is holding true so far as you mentioned from the secure IBD registry for children with IBD. So we generally would feel, for example, that a teenager whose Crohn's disease is very well controlled through the use of an anti-TNF drug is probably not at any more risk than one of his teenage peers. I think there are some things we still don't know about these observations in children and talking now about children in general rather than specifically with IBD. But I, I think we don't know whether they just don't acquire the virus at all or whether they truly do acquire it as often but have more asymptomatic disease so that we're not aware that they are positive. I, I, I guess that will become clearer with more testing, um, but I don't know, Dr. Allen, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think the low rates are perhaps unrecognized asymptomatic occurrence or just not acquiring it? I, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, um, if you'd asked me, um, uh, about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, I would have said it, it's likely that um, they're being infected, but they're not being symptomatic, and most of them are remaining asymptomatic. But there are now some uh, newer data that might even suggest that perhaps um, they are uh, perhaps um, uh, not being infected as often as we think, not yet you know, 100% sure about that, but there are some signals that require further research to clarify that. So in, in Ottawa, um, I don't know of any of any of our kids that have got COVID. Um, in talking with the parents and kids, the vast majority are following the public health advice of distancing, and, and I think that has a lot to do with it. I also think in our discussion Tuesday that was pretty in-depth overall, as it relates to the drugs, it's pretty optimistic. And I think more of our concerns really revolved um, around um, the kids that were sick. So rather than necessarily the drug, it might be the prednisone is just because those are in the sickest patients. And so really, you know, our, our, we came to the conclusion that, you know, it's, it's um, in those sick kids or the flare kids, um, talk to the doc that's taking care of your child because, you know, when when they can relax and and do it. But overall, you know, it was relatively optimistic. And and one thing I, um, Eric and, and Ann brought forth was the European experience in the pediatric uh, with this. And, and I don't know if you have that information on hand, Eric, that you wanted to share with the uh, webinar. Uh, so sorry, you mean the pediatric experience regarding the secure IBD? From the, or, port, uh, the, the Porto, Porto group. group right. Yeah, so it's it's getting a little bit older now. Maybe Anne, you can update. I don't know if anything new has come out, but there were eight cases that um, 
that were reported uh, a few weeks ago now and were published uh, and essentially all did well, but I'm sure there have been more cases reported now. And Anne, are you aware of more or maybe Ed? I think uh, what Dave was referring to really was just the fact that the European pediatric gastroenterologists and the Israeli pediatric gastroenterologists, when they've had the same discussions as we've been having and when they've reviewed the data, their conclusions and their recommendations have been exactly what we've been saying here tonight. And I think um, a part of that is, part of it is because based on the observations, the children with well-controlled IBD on biologics don't seem to be having a worse illness. And also the fact that we all recognize how important it is for kids to be with their peers and um, going through the same maturation and experiences at school and in university as other people. So not keeping them away from that if there isn't good evidence that it's necessary. Oh, that's great. And I, I just wanted to inform the audience that we are gonna go a little bit long if you didn't see the message. We'll probably go another 15 minutes or so with questions and that sort of thing, because I think this is a really useful and informative discussion that I think people are, judging by the number of people in the audience that have stayed, are really getting a lot of value out of this. Um, related to what you were saying and about the, how mild people are getting it or potentially maybe not getting it, I have a question for Dr. Allen. Um, and this actually came from my teenage daughter. She's the one that, that suggested this question. And the question is why? Why are children so mild or not getting it? And why are elderly people getting it so severely? Um, is there something different about their immune systems? Is there something different about uh, some other factor with the virus that may be causing this difference? So, so that's a great question. And uh, we really don't know the answer to that for sure. There are some ideas, though, and we and others are actually doing some research um, in this regard. But, but there are some, some thoughts. Um, and I'll share with you uh, one example of a virus that I spend a lot of time focused on, as Anne is aware, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, when young children, let's say a two-year-old, uh, when those children get uh, Epstein-Barr virus, this is the same virus that causes mononucleosis or kissing disease, they're completely well for the most part. Most of them don't even know that they get infected at all. Uh, same virus in a teenager or an adult who is not immune to the virus, and they can get quite ill with infectious mononucleosis. We think in that situation, what is happening is that the, the younger child's immune system puts up less of a fight against uh, the virus, and it's almost as if there's a negotiation between the uh, younger individual's immune system and the virus so that the immune response that results is not one that overshoots. In other words, it might well be in older individuals, what we're looking at is an immune response that uh, did more than it was supposed to do. And so the body then is an innocent bystander in a battle between the virus and the immune system. Of course, that's a gross simplification, but that's one of the thoughts that um, uh, many people feel might be happening here. There, there are some other ideas as well, but generally speaking, a lot of the uh, consequences of uh, COVID seem to be an immune system that has um, behaved in a manner that uh, might be all over and above what is required to actually just kill the virus. Oh, that's great. That's Thank a you. Great question. I'll tell her. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. There's a question from the audience that I think is really important, and I'm gonna put uh, Dr. Desoten on the spot a little bit for with it. Um, we we talked a lot about back to school and back to work for adults, but really back to school for kids. What we didn't talk about, and and what we're seeing obviously in kids is a lot of social isolation, a lot of feeling like they're not able to spend time with their friends. Um, and, and being down in the dumps, you know, and really even some depression we're seeing in our patients. And one question came from the audience is about uh, a, a teenager who is hoping to get out and spend time with her boyfriend. 
Um, and, you know, there's some details that I don't want to repeat in terms of her personal situation, but she is immunosuppressed. And what are you telling your teenagers who want to spend time with their significant others who may not have seen each other for the past two months? I think you're still muted. No, you're still muted. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I was muted elsewhere. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a difficult challenge. I, um, as I said a few times, I have many children, um, and I, even though they're not you know, suppressed in my family, we do have to follow the rules of the of the um, the local government, uh, and so we we do talk about that um, with my patients who have. Uh, as we start to increase our ability to be, be less socially distanced. I do think that um, it's, it's okay to, to meet up in small groups, less than 10, less than really five, um, and keep that social distancing, but at least give people the opportunity to, to, to see each other, speak. Um, it's a little harder with, with a significant other, um, and I understand that. Um, but And it, it's also hard with a, a young teenager to um, give them a little bit of line or leeway uh, and not expect that they will also take more leeway than they're being given. Um, that being said, I do think it's a critical part, and, and, and really um, uh, it's important for them to have an opportunity at least to see each other, at least to see, maybe, maybe see each other within the confines of some one of the other's homes uh, and uh, and be, be have some, some uh, closeness. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, even sitting on the lawn six feet apart and having a chat is certainly reasonable. Uh, but difficult for teenagers to do, I think. One of my daughter, again, my teenage daughter's favorite movies is the movie Five Feet Apart, if anybody knows that one, which is literally about two late teens, early 20s with cystic fibrosis who were not able to stay six feet apart. Uh, and it is, I won't ruin the ending, but it's not a happy ending. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think my recommendation for, for our patients is not to do that, not to hang out with your significant other quite yet. Uh, unless you're staying outside kind of quite a two meters, six feet apart at minimum. Um, all right. And, um, you know, I think uh, maybe back to more something a bit more serious, Dr. Allen, uh, people keep talking about a vaccine for COVID-19 and um, the hopes that we're going to have one soon and that will solve all of our problems. Can you speak a little bit about the vaccine development so far and where we're at? Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, yeah, we really do need a vaccine, um, and it's just absolutely amazing. There are just so many, there are about 100 vaccines that are being, uh, you know, evaluated at the moment. There are varying stages of, uh, of development. Uh, only a handful, though, uh, are actually um, in clinical trials, uh, phase one trials at the moment. Um, so the, the, the pace is moving very, very rapidly. Uh, it's not likely, though, that there will be a vaccine before at least a year, um, maybe 18 months even. So um, uh, some people have even said, you know, that might be, um, you know, uh, somewhat even short. But but the answer really um, is uh, is that um, the pace of vaccine development is very very rapid. Uh, it's really important to realize, though that there are quite a lot of additional work that needs to be done uh, that I refer to as vaccine readiness, that we need to uh, be able to um, get a better understanding of what um, uh, antibody responses uh, to COVID really mean in terms of protection. Uh, like, for example, if somebody gets COVID, uh, how long, and they get antibodies, how long do those antibodies last? Um, does that mean that they don't need a vaccine, or does it mean that if they do have antibodies, then they get a vaccine? Is that is that safe? So there are a number of um, uh, important questions that need to be answered um, over the next um, uh, several months. And what about the concept of herd immunity? What does that mean, and what does it mean for for children and families with IBD? So um, uh, herd immunity uh, refers to that situation where. Uh, the more individuals one uh, that that 
in a given community that are immune to a particular infection, the less likely it is that the infection will spread from one person to the next. And so there's a threshold number that has emerged for COVID, for example, of uh, at least uh, 60% of, uh, of the population would have to be uh, immune to prevent um, spread. It's, it's, it's like um, a forest fire and the, uh, the uh, firefighters um, removing certain trees and brushes to interrupt the spread. And so essentially, that is what one is looking at. Uh, hopefully, um, we can uh, achieve that level of immunity without um, uh, people being severely ill um, as a result of that. Um, uh, but it, it's a wait and see a kind of a, a situation that we're in. And so or how will we be able to achieve that level of immunity without there being um, more people being admitted to hospitals, the ICU, and, and unfortunately having additional loss of life? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take some quick fire questions from the audience and just uh, direct it to one, uh, you know, one person at a time so that we can get that answered and then we'll we'll wrap things up after that. Uh, Dr. Gold, there was a question about uh, whether there's any information about patients with PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis and IBD. So that's a liver disease that uh, frequently has IBD associated with it uh, and how those patients might be doing with COVID-19. So there's no data that's been published yet. There's actually a, a PSC registry, um, very similar to sort of, not, and not as organized, but like CCF um, uh, for parents and patients. And they've got an ongoing um, HIPAA IRB approved protocol looking at and collecting data. Um, chronic disease um, at CDC is helping them um, provide statistical support. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but have the information and I can make that available to um, you, Eric, and, and the organizers. Um, so if anybody's interested, they can link to that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mack, a question came in about uh, wearing masks. So should kids and teens at school be wearing masks and gloves when they go? Well, uh, right now, uh... In Quebec, they're going to be opening up the primary schools and not the high schools and stuff. And and um, recommendations are to wear masks, but I'm not sure how you can get a five, six, or seven year old to wear a mask all day long. And and so I think there's there's recommendations, and then there's pragmatism. So uh, um, I I I would I think the teachers have been instructed to wear the masks, and that sounds reasonable because you know no spread but uh these are tough questions and to to really see how they're going to make these recommendations and then have these five-year-olds follow them and stay six feet apart and all of those things and i think it's important to know dr allen brought this up is that it's not just about wearing a mask it's about not touching the outside of the mask yeah. it's about potentially cleaning the mask on a regular basis yeah. It's a matter of even if you're wearing gloves, if you're then touching your eyes and your face, the gloves are completely pointless because the, the virus is on your gloves. So practically, uh, it's not really a realistic thing to insist that young kids wear masks all day. And in Sweden, uh, um, where my daughter teaches, uh, uh, they have not closed the schools and uh, they don't wear masks there. But they've gotten into some trouble with high death rates there and high infectious rates there as well, infection but, rates there as well. Again, it's the same as here. It's the older people. Yes, exactly. Not, not in the schools. Not, the, not in the schools and not the young people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Griffiths, a few people have asked in the audience of how long they should be waiting until their last dose of prednisone or until you know they're below a certain dose before going back to school and work. Uh, after being on a decreased dose of, of prednisone, do they wait until they're just under 20 milligrams or what do they do? Um, well, I think most of the guidelines uh, around the world have suggested this 20 milligram point. That's for an adult size teenager or an adult. Um, so basically anybody who's 40 kilograms or more. And then for the smaller children, 
the figure we used was 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. It's very arbitrary. I think that the important thing is, is that the person is well um, and is on their taper and, and really seems very healthy. I, I think if you are at that stage, uh, and most people, unless the condition is not responding, um, and in that case, usually moved on to something else and still able to taper the prednisone. But most people, if they have responded, are, are feeling well at that 20 milligram mark. Um, so I think it's a bit individual basis and good to talk with your individual doctor, but uh, doses below that, I think have not been associated with uh, worse illness. Great, thank you. And I'll field the last question. The last question was about uh, medicines like Stelera or Ustekinumab, as opposed to the anti-TNF biologics like Remicade, Humira, Inflectra, Infliximab, um, and, and whether those are present a different risk uh, in people with IBD. And the, the quick answer is we just don't know. The Secure IBD Registry uh, does not have enough patients in it yet to be able to distinguish the different biologics. There's some good signs in medicines like Stilera based on the numbers that we've got that it's uh, not any worse for sure than, than the anti-TNF biologics, but we just don't have the numbers yet to know uh, what happens with patients on Stilera compared to the, the anti-TNF biologics. So more to come on that. So with that, I wanted to thank all of you uh, very, very much for joining us and spending all this time today, uh, both preparing your slides and then presenting to the audience. Really appreciate it. I think it's a great honor to be able to have this international representation and have the joint collaboration with NASPGAN, as well as to have international experts like Dr. Allen, Dr. Griffiths, Dr. Mack, Dr. Desoden and Dr. Gold. And so I hope that the audience has enjoyed the, the webinar and has learned a lot, and we will be back next week. Um, to wrap things up, I'm going to do as we usually do, and that is to thank our uh, frontline workers, uh, including the healthcare providers. As you know, Friday was uh, Doctor's Day in Canada, and next week is uh, Nurses Week. Uh, and so without the nurses in particular, the doctors couldn't work. Uh, they truly are frontline, and they do a lot of the work uh, with patients that you know we can't do. And so thank you to all our nursing colleagues as well as to all the physicians are, that are out there treating COVID uh, on the front lines in the emergency departments and especially in the long-term care facilities, uh, as well as any long-term care workers as well. And then I, I want to conclude by saying that, again, the, this, these webinars, eight weeks now, are brought to you by Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, we are committing a lot of time and a lot of effort to try to keep you informed as the COVID-19 pandemic progresses and as things change very rapidly. Uh, we, all the physicians and nurses that are on the task force, are volunteers. However, we're supported by Crohn's and Colitis staff, uh, and you know there's there's resources that are required to both pay the staff as well as to run these webinars. So, if you have found these webinars useful, I would ask please, please donate something, whatever you can afford, to Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, in particular, at gutsywalk.ca. There is a team called Gil and Eric's COVID IBD webinars team, and we are trying to raise money for the Gutsy Walk, which is the top supporter, the top non-government supporter of IBD research in Canada, and the number two non-government supporter of IBD research in the world. And the Gutsy Walk really is the primary source of funding for any research that we do in Crohn's and colitis. So if you appreciate these webinars, if you've gained any value out of these webinars, please go to that link shown there and donate to our team uh, or to any, any team is fine. We're okay with that, but we'd rather be the number one team. So if you can join our team or donate to our team, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, please donate at the link below. And thank you once again. We will send out information about next week's webinar uh, as soon as uh, we have more details, but you'll also get some uh, a feedback form for this webinar. Please submit your questions. We do look at your questions every week and we derive our questions that we ask the guests based on what you ask us. So thank you for submitting your questions and your feedback and uh, hope to see you next week. Take care, everybody.